Well, Maria said taking things for granted. You know, when we take things for granted, we have a heart that turns to granite. <laughs> you realize that? Sometimes we, we take and forget to, to thank God and, and thank others and be grateful. So it's got uh, important. The book of Judges, chapter 6 through chapter 8, we're going to be kind of talking about this guy called Gideon. Now, Israel has this problem that she's kind of on again and off again in her relationship with the Lord. And we're told here that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, the world might say, well, that's not so bad. But what does God have to say about something? We, we don't put what the world has to say as our standard for life. But what God has to say is our standard. And so it was in the sight of the Lord that they did evil. So he turned them over into the hands of the median. And the Medianites took and had seven years of disciplining Israel. Now, this is like, there's like eight times between uh, uh, Judges and, and Samuel, I think, or uh, Saul, in which God allowed Israel to get in trouble with their enemies because they were in trouble with God. They weren't doing what God asked. They, they got into a idolatry or, or something. And so, you know, we look at the United States. The United States has had different episodes where we've had some bad things happen. Usually, it's a result of when the nation starts going away from God. And uh, we're going to send you guys a link to watch a, a gentleman talking about the revivals and, and stuff of the past. I think that's important. But I, I couldn't do it justice uh, to talk his talk. But here we are with Gideon. Him and his family may or may not have done too much wrong. I don't know for sure, but they were probably caught up in the culture. I mean, it's really easy to get caught up in the culture, isn't it? What does the world have to say? You know, Satan always comes in with a counterfeit. You know, we're going to do this because it's for the good. And then we do these other things. And so, you know, we'll vote for evil as long as it has some perceived good value, especially if we get something out of it, right? And so, like Gideon, I think many of us are facing, what's the hand of the Lord going to be uh, disciplining our nation? Is he going to discipline all of us? Well, I look at Israel when it was in Egypt and God brought the judgment on Egypt, the children of Israel were protected from the land of Goshen. So that was, that was kind of a good thing because the crime there was Egypt's, not, not Israel's. So, but this is Israel had gotten herself in trouble again. And so, I mean, the Midianites were like grasshoppers, it says. You couldn't number them. There were so many. And so they would come in and they would rob and pillage. You know, they'd work all, Israel would work all, har you know, spring and that, getting ready for a harvest. And it's about time for harvest or they've collected the harvest. Here comes the bad guys and take it. So they're starving practically. They're living in caves and, and hidden. And Gideon is down hiding kind of in a ditch, you know, beating out some food so they can take it home for his family to eat. When the angel of the Lord appears and said, Mighty man of valor. Now, the picture of Gideon isn't one of valor, is it? I mean, he's hiding in a ditch, hoping he do not get caught while he beats out enough wheat so he can, you know, have a tortilla for dinner. <laughs> so here, here you've got what I would say if you look at it, you know, it would be like, Who me? <laughs> And so, 
you know, Gideon's uh, telling the angel of the Lord, you know, he says, um, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us about from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So maybe he wasn't fully aware of what would bring the judgment. Because he hasn't confessed the sin. But the Lord is merciful. And because... I, I believe Gideon believed those stories that were told to him. And he knew that if God's hand had done that before, where's the hand of God now? And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? In this, the might that you have. I had to think about that for a little bit. Doesn't seem like he had a lot of strength, does it? Doesn't seem like he had a lot of might. Does God need our strength? Does he need our courage? But he would call on to us to have courage in him. This is important for us to realize that our courage should be in the Lord. Our strength should be in the Lord. Our boldness should be in the Lord, who we are in Christ. In ourselves, we can see that we're not the mighty people of God. We don't have a whole lot of valor in our own personal strength. Even on, on our best of days, it doesn't take too much and we can get weakened pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. We are limited beings. Now, some people take things much better than other people. I'll grant that. I accept that. But we're to have courage, and our courage needs to be placed in not our circumstances, and not in a man, not in anything, but the Lord God. That's the strength, that's the might that we're going, even though we might be weak. Scripture says, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because they know their God. God is their wealth. God is their strength. And we have to refocus, because faith, faith does not rely upon what I see. See, if, if everything is fine and wonderful, that's pretty easy to have faith in that moment, right? What happens when things aren't wonderful? What happens at 2, 3 in the morning when the baby's awake with 104 temperature? You going to have faith? You know, it's wonderful when you slept through the night and you're getting up and you're going, we slept through the night, the kids didn't bother us, things are good. You know, and it's another thing when the dog's going crazy, waking us up. When the child is not feeling well, when we can't sleep, or we're trying to figure out problems that are beyond our, our own capability sometimes. But that's where faith is supposed to be engaged. At its height, is in the circumstances that are going on, we give God praise, glory, and thanks. You're the God who delivers your people. You're the God who intervenes in our circumstances. You're our hope. You're our strength. See, that, that gives us a valor. That gives us a might. That gives us a courage that we don't have ourselves. When Joshua was going to take over after Moses had passed away, I mean, here you got to follow the greatest leader of the time. This is a guy who God used to bring down Egypt. This is a guy, the words he spoke had power. 
And they didn't even follow Moses very well. <laughs> and now, Joshua's going to go. The Lord told him and the people told him, only be of a good courage, be bold, be strong. That's the leadership that uh, I think is missing often in the Christian community. We are not of a good courage. The good courage is, it's not a false courage. It's not bravo, you know, chismo stuff. It's God is my strength. God, if he's with me, who can be against me? If God be for us, who then is going to really be able to come against us? But, you know, this is a guy who's watched seven years of people being beat up. He's probably called out a few times and said, God, don't let them rob my, my little harvest. And they still got it wrong. But God comes and shows up and says, it is time for Israel to get right with God. And even though you're not right with God, I'm going to make things right for you anyways. Isn't that nice of God? Isn't that good of God? He's not telling them here even that they need to, to pray or to repent or anything else, so to speak. His message is, I'm with you. And I think it's because Gideon remembered <coughs> the teachings about God. And he, he believed God could do it, but why wasn't he doing it? We don't always understand God and circumstances and why, but if we will wait upon him, if we'll seek him, he'll reveal that he's with us. And if he wants us to repent of something, if we know of something we need to do, we need to do it. Well, he asked for God to prove that this is a divine word because, you know, they didn't really have a Bible to go back and check out what was being said. And there's proof. <coughs> the angel of the Lord consumed the mill, stayed. Then he asked God, you know, if this is you doing it, uh, put the dew upon this fleece and let the ground be dry. And it was so. Maybe that was a coincidence of this time. Lord, make sure the fleece is dry and the ground is wet. And so that happens. Sometimes we try to put out fleeces and we get fleece that but, you know, this is a guy whose his faith was not great. He kept asking for a sign. Wow. So this is a, he, he says to God, you know, how can this be that I'm going to deliver? My family's the poorest and I'm the, I'm the least in my family then. Who am I Really? And we see that this is not a guy who has great faith. He needs to have reassurance. He, he, he's like a baby Christian. You know? Okay, if, if this is you, <laughs> I, I believe, but help my unbelief. Any of us ever had those moments, those times, those areas that we are not strong in our faith and we're looking and, and we're wondering, how can God use me? How can God work out this circumstance? How can God intervene? But we have that little mustard seed of faith that won't go away. And Jesus said, that's all the faith you need to have. If you have but the, the faith of a mustard seed, and a couple of years ago, if you'll remember, I had Maria hand out mustard seeds, how small they were. Those are pretty small. Most of us are looking at the big. Most of us are looking at the strong. Most of us are looking at the capability. When Samuel went to find the king, the first king of Israel, Saul was about 18 inches taller than everybody else. Now that is a kingly looking guy, right? What a miserable failure, though, he was with God. I mean, he was rebellious and stubborn and disobedient to God. And God said, no, 
So God's telling Samuel, go to the house of Jesse, and there I have prepared a man after my own heart. So he goes, Jesse's got all these sons, and boy, they're pretty enough good-looking guys. You know, surely this is a gun, right? No? No, Lord? Oh, okay. Well, this guy, you know, he's not quite as tall, maybe not as hand, but he'd still make a good king, right? And God just kept denying. He says, you're looking at the outward. And that's what man does. We look at the outwardness. We look at what what's the, the beauty that we see, the strength that we see, the thing that is giving our flesh appeal. And he says, that's not what I look at. I'm, I'm looking for the heart of the person. And then he's like, well, is that it? Well, we got one more little run to the family, you know. Freckle-faced kid, you know, <laughs> the ugly stepchild. It's like, you know, it's David. And here comes this little rooty kid, you know, probably just working off some baby fat. Who knows? Maybe he was buck tooth even. You know? But he certainly wasn't the first choice that you look upon. It's like, uh, is there anybody else? <laughs> And that's how Gideon felt. There's got to be somebody that comes from a richer you know, family. Somebody of greater stature here that the people will follow. You know, who am I? I'm really, I'm really, uh, we're the smallest tri of the tribes. We're the least of the community. We're the nobodies. We live on the wrong side of the tracks. Isn't that strange that God does that? That like God picks somebody who's not strong in their own ability? That God doesn't choose the guy or the gal that looks like they're the ones that can do it. You know, they, they think that Samson was kind of like maybe a bald-headed little pot-belly guy that made them wonder, <laughs> where did this strength come from? <laughs> Because he certainly didn't look like a great strong man. And, and you know, it would be one thing if they could look at this guy with a ripping and muscles and he's bigger and stronger than everybody else. And so they kept, you know, Delilah wanted, you know, what's the secret of your strength? Because you don't look like the average strong guy. Think about this with me for a moment. Why would, why would they realize that he had strength that came from something other than physical ability. Because, I mean, haven't you seen some strong people? I mean, I've, I've seen some of these guys that are, I mean, they're, they're like a you know little miniature tank with legs and arms. You know? <laughs> if you call those arms, and I mean, if you're really muscular, they're almost grotesque looking, right? Mm -hmm. It's freaky. It's like, wow, that's a muscle? <laughs> I don't know. Now, that guy's wrist is bigger than my thigh. <laughs> yeah? I don't have to guess where his strength comes from. I, I can see it, can't you? But this is a guy that they couldn't, you know, where's his strength come from? And Gideon is one of those kind of guys that didn't look like he, and he didn't even feel like he was the kind of guy who could do the job that God's asking him. So, he, you know, he needed some reinforcement to get himself started. You and I don't need all of that because if we'll learn the lesson here that if God's word says it, we need to just believe it. We don't have to go through all this, uh, I need some reinforcements on. Because I have the... I have the scripture before me. Somebody else has already done it to prove that when God says it, you can take it to the bank. You can believe it. Here's this guy who then goes out and tears down the, the idol of Baal. And boy, now everybody's upset. They want to kill him. I love his dad's answer. Well, if he's really God, let him deal with it. <laughs> if he's really a God... He can take and chastise my son. He can do it. We don't have to do it if he's really God. Good answer, wasn't it? But they don't, you guys don't have to fear the God of the Amorites. You don't have to fear the power structures. We, we have all this that we see 
that is greater than us. Who are we? We're no mega church. Yeah. Who am I? I look in the mirror and I go, wow, Lord. You know, now I got the new glasses, I really go, oh, wow. You know, there for a while, I would say, hey, I'm not looking too bad. Oh, yeah, that's right. I need to get new glasses. I haven't had new glasses in three to four years, you know. God, though, looks at the heart of people. And that's what he determines over all that you and I look at, even in our own life. Who am I? Well, I'm no one in and of myself. But in Christ, I'm precious. He died for me. And I am a joint heir with Christ. By faith, I believe God's word says that, that if God be for me, who can be against me? And even if I am slain, I'm immediately ushered into the rewards of heaven. Such a deal. Such a deal. That we don't have to fear anyone or anything but God. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And evil hates us. And so, he begins getting people excited. That God's with me, God's for us. God says he's going to do it. Now, people are having confidence, not in little Gideon. But they've heard the stories of God. And when he recounts what God did with those signs, the proof of it, he's amassing a large army. Now he's got some confidence. Got a big army. And God says, you know what? You got too many people. Tell anybody that's afraid and doesn't want to do this, go home. You know, like half of them went. You know, when our churches always would start shrinking, we start, we have a Gideon revival. <laughs> and then God says, ah, still way too many. Really? I kind of like that bigger group. <sighs> no, no, you still got, hey, let's see how they, how they bow down to get the water. Yeah. Okay. By the time God gets done cutting down the army, it's only 300 guys against a huge army. And God says, now you'll know it's not you. And Israel won't think it's their own strength, their own might, that brings about the victory. And that's often the challenge for us. Sometimes we, we, we get an, uh, an idea from God, we start wanting to do something, and we start amassing all this to go do it. And then God starts stripping some of this stuff away. And we go, wow, God must not be in this, right? I thought that. And said, God said, no, 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 I want you to do it, but I don't want you relying on that. I want you to keep your resolution, your resolve on me. So 300 guys and Gideon and his one person Folks, friend, you know, God tells them, go down, sneak into the enemy's camp. For I've delivered them to you. And so they're sneaking around, and then they hear this one guy telling another, I, I had this dream the other night, and it's bothering me. So he tells them about this, this barley bread, this roll of barley bread that came rolling down and wiped everything out. The guy's little interpretation is that's Gideon, and God's going to wipe us out. They're afraid. He goes back and says, guess what, guys? They're really afraid of us. They're more afraid of us than we are of them. And they know, if you think about it, barley, the barley bread was just a common, and that's a poor man's bread. You know, it has been a good loaf of bread, Lord, something, you know, artiste, <laughs> the good stuff, you know. Not just simple Little roll of bread. So when God finally has them line up around the camp with a pitcher that's got a lamp inside, so the light's kind of hidden. And he says, at my command, drop the, the lamps. So that means the light comes out. 
They shot up the Sword of Lord and Gideon. And the enemy just went crazy. Killed them top. They didn't even have to draw blood. All they had to do was drop <laughs> the covering and shout. That's the battle of the Lord plan. See, that's the thing that we need to get is what's God's plan? How does God want us to attach it? Because it's the sword of the Lord and us. And we might be few, but they're no match for the Lord. And God just wants us to be the proclaimer. He wants us to make sure people know who to give the glory to. Because now we know it's not us. We know that we came out of this walking in shaky faith. <laughs> we know we didn't have a big army. God kept cutting it down. You know 300 against that mighty army was not enough. This is an army that should have been more disciplined. Shouldn't have gotten so panicky. But you know what? The enemy's no match for God. They are no match for the sword of the Lord. What's the sword of the Lord? The word of God. Isn't that what the scripture says? And take with you the sword, the word, which is the sword. The enemy cannot win the light being revealed. Christ was in us, the hope of glory and the word of God. So I'm going to take this out into the New Testament for a moment. When Jesus had the multitudes to feed, and he tells them, his disciples, let's feed them. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know if you've looked, but we, don't, we have not had offerings of that size, Lord. Even if there was a 7-Eleven here, it couldn't even have enough food. There's not enough here. Uh, Lord, are you... <laughs> He's always asking the impossible, isn't he? <laughs> All right, well, let's go see if somebody's got some food. <laughs> you know, they find the little guy, the little boy's got two fish and a couple loaves of barley. He's not kind of coincidental. Mm -hmm. They go back and say, this is all we can find. <laughs> Yeah, barely, I'm not even going to feed the 12 of us. <laughs> I mean, you get the first bite, Jesus. <laughs> but here's the thing. It wasn't much. In fact, in and of itself, it wasn't enough to meet the need. But once things are completely given to the Lord in his hand, it's more than enough. When Gideon committed himself fully into the hands of the Lord. He was more than a comforter. When we take what little we have and we fully commit it to the Lord, now can you imagine a little guy, no, 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 that, that, that's mine. No, it wouldn't have ever been part of the miracle. The miracles happen when we totally put and commit it into the hands of the Lord. Gideon had to fully commit it into the hands of the Lord. Your word said it. You said it. You've proven it. I'm going to step out and chase and do it. The little boy. And he got to take home more food. Think about that. You may not feel like you're able to take on the challenges that are going on around us. And in and of and by ourselves, we're not. But in Christ... The scripture says we're more than conquered. He's promised us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Here's the promise. In this life, you will have tribulations. That's a Jesus promise. Oh, drats, I don't like that promise, Jesus. Give me the one that everything is going to be a rose garden and okay. He says, yeah, that'll be a rose garden with thorns. <laughs> but I'm with you even until the very end. 
the scripture says, many are the affliction of the righteous. Well, I don't know if I really want to be righteous then, Lord. How do you know you, you're righteous? Because you have many afflictions. Well, that's a, that's a terrible measurement of success and righteousness, isn't it? And if that's all you take from the scripture, you, you're going to be defeated. But it says, many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from all of them. God will deliver from all of them. So we're not guaranteed a life of comfort on this side of heaven. Now, it's nice to have comfort and blessing. God sometimes allows that. But even without the comfort, even without the appearance of the blessing, you find yourself looking to him saying, I still have a peace that you cannot take from me. What little I have left, it still all belongs to you and in your hands. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth, just like it is in heaven. God's way of dealing and, and working out things, not the way you and I would do it. Would you take a shepherd kid with a slingshot to go up against a, a giant? Ah, uh, no thank you. Even with an AR-15, I don't want the kid to do it. <laughs> yeah. And yet, a little stone, a little guy, and a lot of faith in God. He knew the story of Gideon. The sword of the Lord and David Sweeney. And you know, if I was going up against him, I would be trying to look at the best. How can I hide and pop up on him? You know, catch him unaware. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the smart. Guerrilla warfare is a smart attack. It really is. Now, he chose to run after straight towards this giant. Are you kidding me, David? <laughs> Have you seen how big he is? Even if he doesn't hit you with the spear, just the, the shaking of the ground will probably break your ankles. I mean, are you nuts? To the world, we are nuts, aren't we? So I want you to take and look at this differently today, that you may not have great strength. And you might not have great faith, but what you do have, go in that might. Because the Lord is with you. Now, if you've got something in your life that needs to get repented of, that's a good idea to get that out. You know? It, it's a good idea to make sure everything's cleaned up so that there's no trip but, that the enemy can use. But at the same time, Israel wasn't fully cleaned up yet, had it? <coughs> when God said, I'm going to step into the situation now. Dad's home, and he ain't happy. You want to take it on my dad? Yeah. Your dad can get up, my dad can get up your dad. Oh, absolutely, guys. Right? That comes back to that. Our, our Heavenly Father is... God. You know, he just goes, and the demons flee. Jesus said... I kick out devils by the finger of God. <laughs> Flick. <laughs> People that are dead, it's just like waking them up from sleep. Come on, get up. There's nothing impossible for Father. And that's where we have to get out of the idolatry of self, thinking that we need to have greater strength. We've got to have greater faith. We've got to be better than we have been. Now we're going to start by trusting that God is with us and obeying his word. And we're going to step out. And he's going to allow some challenges to come. And he's going to cause some of our confidence to get shaken off. That by the time we're standing there, we're standing only in him, not ourselves.
not in our constitutional rights. Though they might be God-given, it's God who are standing against. It's God who will be glorified in our life. Whether we live or die, to God be the glory. When we become those type of people, we're already there in his eyes. If you think that you're all that, a bag of chip, go home. No, God don't need you. You're already too good. If you know, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm the least likely one to do it, Lord. But if you've said to do it, to you be the glory. Because it's not really all about me. Maria has been trying to tell me that for 40 years. And now the dog is dead. I'm beginning to believe it because, I mean, the dog really reinforced it was all about me. I mean, nobody else gets that excited, jumps up and down and pees on the floor when I come home. The dog did. Nobody else is that excited. And, well, it's not all about us. Who's it about? Because God cares all about us. Do you get that? He cares all about us. He'll count the hair on your head every morning to see how well you're doing. And I don't think twice about the hair on my head. It's, you know, going down the drain. I don't even care how it really comes out. The reason one that's always got to fix it. <laughs> but God cares all about you. So make it all about God so that he can take care of all about you. And I think you'll find life is a lot better that way. But when we have it reversed, oh, what a mess it's going to be. Amen. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you that it's not all about us. It's all about you and that you do care all about us. We thank you, Lord. You choose to, you had a woman take down the king with a nail. Wow. Wow. That little shepherd guy used a stone to take down the giant. You took a guy who was afraid of his own shadow, hiding, who couldn't, he had to have a whole lot of encouragement to get out of the hole and go. But Lord, once, once they just put their trust in you, who you are, great things came out of it. That mustard seed of faith that you've given every one of us. May we begin to refocus our faith, not in ourself, not in our circumstance, not in our abilities, but in you and your word. Forgive us for failing those wonderful, simple truths that if we had just a small mustard seed of faith, the mountains are removed because it's you working in us, through us, mightily, not us. You working in us and through us, mightily. Christ within the hope of glory. Let our focus be back on you, back on your word. Our faith is in you, Lord, not in ourselves. Our faith is not in our strength or our weakness. Our faith is not in our government. Our faith is not in our checkbook. Our faith is in nothing but you, Lord, in you who we put our hope and our trust. And may that hope, trust, and faith be obedient to your word from this day forth. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen. Amen.